I am Peter Rota, and I am uh, Teatro Rota's son. I spent a good deal of time with her, and I spent um, from 19, was it 1978 to um, 87, 88, I was actively working in her business. Intimately familiar with that, the art world as it relates to her sales and how she became successful, and then how to manage all of that. Um, and then I sold the business and focused time on my family, so I spent much less time with her at that point. And then um, in 2000, 2001, kind of reconnected with her. But at that point, she uh, had gone on to Geneva. She was born in the, the very border of Germany, the very eastern border, as a border town named Boyton. It's, it's no longer. So, uh, so the first 10 years of her life, she was there. Um, and then the Second World War came to an end, and her, they had to move. I mean, I think they tried staying there in that house, but it's a traumatic change from from having a, a beautiful house and a, a sweet upbringing until age 10. And then the war came through and, and everything changed. Um, and I, uh, again, I wasn't there. I just hear, I hear stories of her mom trying to keep all the, it was five kids, trying to keep them together um, while they were refugees, trying to get from the eastern sector of Germany to the west. Uh, so that was two years of, of is basically being refugees, kind of what's happening now in, with Syrians. Mm -hmm. It's really, uh, it was a really rough and difficult time. So she definitely was affected by that. Um, and, I mean, there were some, there were some pretty horrific stories about uh, what happened to the family. Well, my, my grandma managed to keep the kids together, um, but uh, some of the stories that I just heard mentioned um, were pretty horrible about what, what was going on, because there's no laws back then. Like the whole country had fallen apart. The soldiers had come through, and then people were just sort of left on their own. They tried to find shelter, right? I mean, just being on the move, trying to, to, to because they could not be in their house anymore. So, uh, you know, living either in the forest, or living in farms, or living in stables, or living somewhere, uh, and scrounging for food either in the forest, or in garbage, or wherever, wherever the, that was possible. Sometimes people would take them in, and they'd have a few days of, of rest, and then they'd move on, or um, you know, try to get on a train somewhere to, to go somewhere. And just the the, the crazy, scary times that uh, because there it, there was no rule of law. So it was it was it was pretty pretty harsh. I ended up settling in, in Wiedenbruck, which is a city in northern Germany. And actually, my grandfather, who was a soldier in the in Second World War survived it um, and uh, got, they were reunited, which is lucky. Uh, a lot of people weren't that lucky. Um, and so she grew up there, but that, the, there too, they were refugees, so the, the town doesn't, the, you know, people were just sort of plunked into, into houses and um, they weren't received very well. It was, it was felt like outsiders, because they, where they were from was very different than where they ended up. But you know, my grandfather figured out how to make that work, um, and the kids raised. My mom always was interested in, in drawing and painting. I think she was she knew she was an artist from a young age on. From a little kid on, she was drawing. Um, and my father, my grandfather, was a, um, a jeweler and a goldsmith. So he uh, made all of his kids. Uh, learn that trade, and part of that was learning how to draw and design things. So her assignment was to, to draw a flower every day for him. And she loved that because she wanted to do that anyway, so she had lots and lots of practice drawing. She wanted to do, go much sooner than she could. I mean, uh, the way her, she always told the story that she had to wait till she was 21, until she was an adult, to, to decide to, to leave. And no longer be under her father's control. Um, and so, as soon as she was 21, she uh, 
hitchhike south to southern Germany where her older brother was studying at the art academy. Oh, at part time. He was interested in design. Um, um, and I mean, he may have taken art classes, but anyway, he was at this particular place that was an art school. Um, and so that, that gave her the, the idea that that's where she wanted to go. She studied there, met my father. He was in his drawing and painting class. Uh, so, <laughs> let's see, my dad, born in 1899, also an artist. Um, his heyday was in 1920s Berlin, in the Weimar Republic. It was a very different kind of art style. He was post-impressionist. Um, and everything changed in the 30s when the Nazis came in made all the artists either, you know, stop what they were painting or only paint what was official. Um, and my father ended up in southern Germany because that's where his first wife, her father, had property. That's why he ended up there. Uh, he, was, he became a professor, professor of the art school there. He was much more, I mean, Berlin and, and wild, crazy times. So um, he would take his painting drawing classes and invite them out to the property. It was a huge property that used to be a former health sanctuary. And people would come out to ostensibly draw, but also to stay. Then he'd usually uh, have people say, you know, like, well, I don't have, we don't have a model. Why don't we just everybody get undressed and do each other? And so it would become a big party. Um, and he was famous for that, so all the art students loved to come out to the property. That was just kind of like the place to go. Um, this is 1960s, right? So there was this whole kind of, um, not revolution, but kind of pushback against the, against the, the culture as it was. Right? The, the, the rigid rules of the 50s and then, you know, sort of looking to the United States as, as what's happening. So it was definitely happening in, in the property that I was growing up, I was born there, you know. You grew up in the middle of all of that craziness. <laughs> she uh, was a student in his art class, and his first wife had passed away, so he was alone with two kids from that marriage. Um, and so he asked her, of all the students, I'm not sure how they decided that, but she, he decided she was the one he wanted to ask to marry. And she said yes on condition that you could continue doing her art. Um, so she took that on, so running that property, which is a huge house. I mean, it used to be health sanctuary, so it was like 10 bedrooms. And then there was cottages all over the property. And it, it was a, it's a big job to take care of that and take care of the kids, take care of him, and then still do her art career. When, and she did, um, and she became more successful than he was. She started with, with uh, oil paintings that, um, if I remember correctly, were Hmm. There, her first person, one person show, um, 1967. These paintings were these strange sh sh humanoid forms <laughs> drawn in in, uh, in these boxes. Uh, I remember that piece of it. Um, there, there were some pretty some some pretty dark memories that she was working through, both from the war, I think, and also the uh, the. A really traumatic thing happened on the way down from northern Germany to visit or to go to art school. She was getting shows, she was getting sales, and, um, and then she won the Villa Romana Prize in '68. It was a year stipend in Florence. Uh, it was a beautiful place, my God, I got to go with her. She got the whole floor of this old villa, uh, everything provided for. Uh, it was a beautiful place. Uh, all the materials she could want, all the access to museums or wherever she wanted to go. So it was a great year, and she also realized during that year that she probably didn't want to be with my dad anymore. So that's, that's what set in her mind the idea that she needed to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and then, let's see, 68, 70, uh, so two years later, yeah, she had a series of shows in Spain. Uh, with a, a gallery. She traveled there with a gallery owner who arranged the shows who was also her lover, and then they decided to go from uh, was it Barcelona to Montevideo on a cruise ship. My dad and I got a postcard from her saying that that's what she, they, she had decided. Implications were just freedom for her to, again, to explore her own, like what she wanted to do. Well, she went with this man who was somewhat crazy, um, in, I guess a um, successful gallery owner, he made lots of money, 
but he was also an alcoholic and after about a, maybe nine months of them traveling in a VW bus through South America, um, he, he needed to be hospitalized because he, he was so, he was drinking too much. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually got shipped back to, to, I think it was Swiss, I'm not sure where he was from. Anyway, uh, so she was suddenly on her own because uh, this guy, you know, didn't die right away, but he was definitely sick. Mm -hmm. She changed what she was um, drawing. She was she changed how what her expression was. You know, uh, the the art that that won her the Villa Romana Prize. I have some hanging right here. It was, it was very detailed anatomical drawings, um, making landscapes out of anatomy, basically. And so then some a friend of hers named Montevideo said, you know, if you really want to make it as an artist, you should go to New York. to New York she was working with uh, still bodies and forms but it, it transformed again into so really the place where she was at affected where she, what kind of work she was doing. She was exploring sexuality, she was exploring um, kind of seeing the body from a different perspective um, and, and then reimagining completely new bodies or kinds of bodies. What she was doing was not at all like anybody else's work. So she's just kind of going off on her own, on her own kind of venture. Well, in New York, she was doing ballet, uh, and she's doing uh, New York City landscape scenes. Like there were some, there were some pieces that have these beautiful um, New York City sky, skylights in them. When I joined her in 1973, that was two years after she arrived in New York, she was barely able to, to script her the rent. I mean, it was, it was hard, um, and she was painting. Um, beautiful paintings, um, but somebody there, another gallery, a friend of hers, a gallery, and said to her, you know, I mean, if you're going to be making paintings, think about this, you make one painting, you sell it, and it's gone, you're making another painting, it takes a lot of work, why don't you think of making graphics or prints, so you can make several of them, um, and that's what I got, got her thinking about, doing some, some graphic work, and so instead of doing this traditional where you do a painting and then do a gicle or a, a reproduction, she decided to uh, look into mezzotint. Then she, she started doing mezzotints, and she, you know, nobody was doing mezzotints. It's very hard to do mezzotints. She was doing these beautiful big things, and so they became very popular very quickly. And because they were prints, they were inexpensive relative to the paintings. So she started making a, a lot of money. I mean, she loved it. She loved being able to buy the stuff she wanted. Right? I mean, there was there was a time um, when uh, what was it? Uh, she was so busy making prints and filling orders. People would come and, and buy whatever it is that she was doing. That she opened up her desk drawer and it was full of checks and cash. And I'm like, what are you doing with all this money? You take it to the bank at least. She was just really happy to be able to open the drawer and go. It's full of money. <laughs> Yeah. So she amazing. loved it. She had a great time. You know, she had she had impeccable taste. I mean, um, as soon as she could, she would afford to, to buy the fanciest things she could. It allowed her uh, freedom to do the things she wanted to do, um, even though they're, you know, this is why I got involved, uh, because um, people would call up, our dealers would call up and say, oh, that horse piece sold really well, make me another horse piece. And, and she'd be like, I'm, don't do that. I'm, I'm making my own art. But she would, she would, you know, obviously, if someone's offering her $20,000, she'd be like, all right, I'll make you another horse piece. And so I'd start listening in on the conversations and um, eventually kind of interposing myself in between her and the art dealers to kind of give her some space. I thought it was my job as her son to, to kind of represent her because she was always complaining that they didn't understand what she was doing as an artist. They just were looking to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. And while she liked the money, there was always a uh, there's that there's that that tension between the art dealer who just wants to you know get whatever sells, he didn't care, and what she was doing, which was more of a of an artistic vision, even within uh, within these mezzotints, like that one for instance, right? That's mm -hmm. a beautiful mezzotint, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot in that. <laughs> At the height of it, um, she there were about ten. Uh, 
what we call big shows, or shows where she had to sh appear uh, in different cities and across the United States. And, you know, she'd be flown in, she'd have a limo, she'd have a red carpet, she'd have, you know, the whole movie star approach, right? So she was, she was really, she was on for those moments. She, and she loved it in the sense that she got all the attention and she certainly loved dressing up for it. But it was also really demanding in the sense that it, it, it took her out of her, her artistic creative process. And so she would go back and forth between these two worlds. And again, my, my job was to kind of mediate between the two so that I would set up all of the show and see all the details. She didn't have to think about any of that. And she would just be handed a ticket and show up and have a, have a party and have a, have, you know, sign lots of things <laughs> and then come back home and, and do more art. So I bought her contract uh, from Hammers in 1982. Uh, they, they decided to get out of the, the whole graphics business. Uh, back then, I don't know if you remember the whole scandal with uh, Dolly and the pre-signed papers and the, the European edition and the American edition and the whatever edition and you know, suddenly, you know, because graphics were, were easy money, right? If you, if, if you had a, uh, something that would sell and, you know, the, the, the rules around an edition or what the size of editions were were not established as well as they are now. Part of that became a lawsuit and I know some of the people that got involved in these lawsuits. There's, a, there's this whole other piece, which is prints, right? Nowadays, we think of prints as you hit the print button on a computer and it print, does a print. Whereas a mezzotint is done by hand, right? And so that, um, that whole fact that it was done by hand, um, at first, prints were supposed to be done, each one the same, right? That's the idea. Uh, and then at some point she realized, wait a minute, the whole special thing about this is that each one is done by hand. You have to ink each plate each time. And so she would change the colors as, as the edition was going through. Or she would change uh, where the colors were. The image you can't change because it's an original. I mean, even if you try to make each one exactly the same, you can't because it's just each one is, a, is an individual work of art. The scandal with the Dalis, for instance, was because they were doing chiclets. They were just doing reproductions, right? They, they would pick a painting and he would pre-sign the blank pieces of paper, right? And they would just print it on there. And if they could print 600, they would, uh, they would do that, right? And, and would sell them all. And that was the scandal. Whereas with, with my mom's work, she would limit her editions to 150. And that was it. Um, and they're all done by hand. It's not like you could hit, you could, you could reproduce it very easily. I mean, mm -hmm. especially the way she did it. Um, normally in printing, you have a plate for each color. You have a red plate, a blue plate, whatever whatever the colors are, and they they get they get inked separately, and then the paper gets put on each time, so you get a, a finished product. She decided to do one plate and do all the colors on on the same plate, and mix it by hand, which made it much more of an individual art, uh, artwork and almost impossible for anybody else to, to to do. But there were galleries that that decided to get out of that whole market because it was clear that they had kind of gone over the top, mm -hmm. and Hammers were one of them. They decided, okay, we're, gonna, we're just not going to do that anymore. 1976 was when it started really selling well, uh, up until, God, um, she, um, year 2000 is when she sold everything and, and retired. So it was a pretty long run. Um, she, had made the, she had made this contract, she was making a huge sum of money. Um, and she was about to buy a loft in New York in, in Soho. She had, she had it all picked out. It was a whole floor that she was going to buy. And then she went to L.A. again with a lover who had arranged for a series of shows in L.A. at his galleries. And he then decided to show her a car in California. And they drove up the coast and ended up in Carmel one night. And she saw this house in the in the realty office window the next morning. And she was like, oh my god, I'm going to buy this house. And she walked in and started negotiating for buying this house. And I get a call, I think that same evening, saying, guess what, we're moving. It wasn't just a little house, you know, studio. It was a huge house onto which she built like a, like a two-story house that became her studio. Um, and then when she moved to Carmel, there was much more of California landscape and horses and, um, you know, she's, it, it, the house that she bought, um, she planted a rose garden. There's lots and lots of rose bushes, so she started doing lots of roses. Um, and the man that that the reason she bought that house is because she was lovers with this man, and he wanted she wanted to have a place f to be with him, and he would send her a dozen roses every Sunday. So 
that was a tradition that uh, that he had. She bought the house in '78, and then um, I bought the contract, and she wanted to go back to New York, and so we she bought um, an apartment in Manhattan. Um, so she had two two places she would go back and forth. Once she had the apartment in New York, uh, she was spending some time there, she decided to um, do something with these graffiti pieces. And so she would talk to whoever she could to, to get interesting graffitis off of the buildings, right? They're usually eight by four sheets of plywood that are covering doors or windows or whatever. So she would just get a new piece of plywood from somewhere and said, here, I'll change it out for you and, and take it home. And then, and then she would add her own art on top of it and make, uh, make this beautiful combination between what the graffiti artist had done and then she added gold leaf or she added gold detailed paintings or she added all kinds of things to it. The, the galleries that were selling her work were all used to selling the next mezzotint. That was kind of the whole way this was set up. It was kind of a, a, um, a defined business. Right? So uh, when I was running the company, um, Every month or every two months, there'd be a new piece, and there were about 300 galleries who would buy one or two or three or ten or whatever of these, and so they would usually just sell out. Um, so there was those galleries were not the kind of galleries to show this graffiti pieces. She wanted to show them. I mean, what was it? Uh, a guy named Saul Steinberg, who is a, um, a venture capitalist, really called an arbitrage finance guy, had a big art collection. Um, got really interested in, in her, um, and so she, he bought one for $30,000. I remember going with her to his office in somewhere in Midtown Manhattan. This fancy, you know, he had like five floors for this building, and this, this big graffiti piece got delivered there, and and, and he, asked, he said to her, so, well, how much do you want for it? And, he, and she goes, why don't you make a price for it? So he goes, 30000 and that's how that got established. Um, well, she had them all in her studio. Um, she got another studio in Brooklyn, a much bigger studio, because the place she had in Manhattan was small. And these pieces are big, so she got a, a, a warehouse in Brooklyn somewhere where she had a bunch of them. Uh, then she had them shipped out to Carmel, because she had galleries in Carmel where she was showing them in her own galleries. Um, and then my uncle wanted to do a show in Germany. Or maybe she had arranged for somebody to have a show. I forget how that went. And so they ended up in his gallery. They were not supposed to stay there. They were supposed to go to this show. And I'm, I'm not sure what happened. Because at that point, I was no longer doing the business. She was doing that with, with her brother. One of those crazy moments, I, and I get another phone call. Guess what? I'm moving. I'm like, what are you doing? She had decided she was done with Carmel, she was done with the whole being in the United States, and she wanted to go back to Europe. And she knew nobody in Geneva. I don't know what got into her as to why Geneva. I mean, once I visited her, I understood, because she picked the old town, which is beautiful, uh, really suited her. She found a beautiful apartment there um, that was, yeah, exquisite. <laughs> and but no, she didn't know French. She didn't know anybody there. So she just kind of arrived there and made her life there. But she had totally reached a peak. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was that was it. And and one of the reasons um, she picked uh, Switzerland or Geneva was that um, what she said about it to me that was most telling was that in Switzerland artists are respected as artists. You don't have to prove yourself as to how much you've sold or or, or anything like that. If you're an artist, that's a that's. A, that's respected and honored. Um, whereas here, it's not so, right? Here, it's sort of like, you know, what have you done to prove yourself? So it's a different kind of, um, and so she really liked the idea of, of being somewhere where, where just being an artist was, was enough. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, she had the book, right? So she definitely had respect, right? So um, even though she didn't speak uh, French, she made friends and connections and thoroughly enjoyed herself. Well, it's interesting. In Europe, um, it is different. I mean, my uncle has a gallery in Germany, and so he was selling uh, her work there. Um, he kind of inspired by me. In 1983, he came visiting, and he saw what I was doing, and he was like, oh, I can do a gallery in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how that started. He's kept on doing it. Um, but um, I would go to the Basel Art Fair um, every year and, and exhibit there. 
uh, so show her work there. Um, and so people in Europe were exposed to her work. Um, um, but yeah, it, it's it's different. In in Geneva, she didn't need to sell anything. She had she had sold her house. She had plenty of money, so she was just doing exactly what she wanted to do. She had no more pressure of making new additions to satisfy some gallery or some like. Okay, we've got sales. We want more. <laughs> None of that was happening, and so she didn't even establish a connection with any gallery there. She just did her artwork and it stood in the studio. <laughs> Landscapes. Um, there's one gigantic uh, horse painting, like, like twice, almost twice as big as this thing. Uh, that isn't that isn't finished, but it was it was unfinished in her studio. Mm -hmm. So she was working on that. Um, mm -hmm. She's working on portraits, um, but the most beautiful ones are the the mountain scenes. I had to go catalog everything. Right, there was, she had, there's about 900 pieces that were left over um, out of what maybe 30,000 that she's done, um, and the exact number is not clear because. She did not keep good records. You know? <laughs> um, so it's not that many in comparison to <laughs> what she did, but still 900 is a lot of pieces. Um, and so there, there are paintings, so a series of paintings from Switzerland, that many of them not finished. Um, and so those are uh, mountain scenes and, and beautiful trees. Um, there are drawings, uh, somewhat erotic drawings, that, that uh, she did maybe in the 90s. Um, there's all kinds of uh, different mezzotints that um, she was working on or, or redoing or adding pastel to it, uh, making changes. Um, I think often that was what happened was if there's one that, that was a mistake or somebody returned one, she would change it or she would add something to it uh, and resell it as an original. Mm -hmm. and so there's some of those left over. All throughout she would do different kinds of things, different drawings or different commissions that, that did not fit in with uh, the mezzotint work that she was doing. Um, you know, like there's a painting in there that, that has a series where she was working with, with double exposure or triple exposure images. Um, and some of those, well a lot of those actually sold. Um, and and they, are not, they are not necessarily part of, you know, there were certain galleries that, that could sell those things. And then she did commissions for people, private things. So, mm -hmm. um, and the f crazy thing is, she didn't record any of that. Um, there, are, there are numerous paintings and drawings that she would do for people privately. Someone would talk to her at a show or whatever, or see her in a gallery, and say, "I want you to do this painting," and they would make an arrangement. And she would do it, and it would disappear. And there's no record. Oh, wow. So there's artwork out there that. Who knows, right? So every once in a while, I see, I get an inquiry, or I see it on the on the internet. Uh, someone has a painting that, that I've never seen before, you know, dancer or a portrait or whatever. I mean, there's all kind of stuff. And same with the with the uh, Gerardica, uh series. That was, I'm not sure what inspired her to do it, but I actually found a, a photograph of her gallery in Carmel, where one of the there's one of the ones that was in the show at the San Francisco Art Institute, and there's another one, framed similarly, looking from this like the same series that's not there anymore. So it must have been sold. So at least one more out there that's with somebody, because I've I always watched her uh, do her work, and so she was always working on one or several things at once, um, and some of it was the whatever latest mezzotint, and some of it was the, these private commissions or paintings or drawings or whatever. So. It, it was always happening. Um, so discovering these was sort of like, oh look, there's yet another thing. I didn't, I didn't even realize she was doing <laughs> that. That um, it fits with her. You know, it wasn't like, oh my god, I, I can't believe she did that. It was sort of like, oh, you know, she just couldn't stop herself. Yeah, interesting. At the time, I was so involved in the art business, I was kind of sucked into the mezzotint thing as well, um, and. Now looking at it, there's a much broader arc uh, into which the mezzotints fit. Um, if you go back to, to where she started, to, to what she was doing with the graffiti pieces and with, uh, with the, geri geriotic, uh, the, the old people having sex pieces, it was, those don't fit with the mezzotints and yet you can recognize her, her hand in all of these.
it speaks for itself, really. I mean, it needs to be seen as uh, as a complete. You know, like, if, if someone can see all of what she's done, which is possible if you were to catalog it all, um, you can get you can get where she was going with it, um, what, how she was looking, how how her sense of looking through things, like this painting, for instance, right? It looks like a landscape scene, but then if you look carefully, you see through things. Um, right. And that's kind of one of her hallmarks to to not just take things at face value, but to look through or into or deeper into something. Um, and certainly in the discussions I've had with her, that's kind of what was inter what she was interested in, sort of a spiritual practice or looking deeper into reality or or not taking things for at face value. Um, same with that meditation right there. The 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 it's not just the surface, right? There's like layers. And so, um, and that painting in there, right, in layers, looking through things. And so it's a consistent theme that she was working on. Again, because I, I grew up with her, lived with her, kind of, I was, like, that's kind of what I understood her art to be about. Um, but I now see that a lot of people never, never got that. You know, they just look at the horse piece or the dance piece or the, the flower piece and it's like, oh, that's a pretty picture. It's like, yeah, you're missing the point. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not about the pretty picture. That's kind of like the external or the, 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 the bow tied around it, but you have to look more carefully to see to see the, the depth in it. The show that I would envision, like the ideal show, would, would show um, pieces that weren't seen. Like not just, you know, maybe some mesotents, a couple, just to kind of get the sense of where they fit in this whole arc. But um, to have the graffiti pieces be part of it as a juxtaposed to the mesotents and to have the, the old um, original anatomy landscapes uh, uh, be part of it and have the, the gerotica shown. And so if you see all of those in sort of succession, you, you get a, a much broader sense of what she was, what she was doing. Um, and I think that's, the, that, that's important to, to do rather than um, just focus on like, oh, she was great at doing horses in mesotent. Like, all right, great. <laughs> that, that doesn't really, doesn't last. Um, but what I think uh, is important is to do a show that that um, shows more than that. Yeah, I, I'm you know I'm sitting in, in what's left of her uh, work. I mean her apartment. This is this is. Um, it's time for me to kind of let go of her in a, in a way. You know, I was holding all that together, hoping that um, or thinking I would be the one shepherding it to to its next whatever iteration. And really, my job is to let it go so it can do that. So the San Francisco Art Institute show was kind of an example of that, where I really didn't have much to do with it. It was it's simply me saying, yes, okay, you can, you can show the pieces. But my intention is to not sell it all off separately. That's already happened. I want to have a representative show that people can get who this person is as an artist. Um, and so that, that is kind of why I'm, I'm, I still have the collection. I mean, you're right, it was overshadowed and she didn't care. She did not make any effort to make connections with proper galleries. She, she, and I didn't either at the time. I, I just I took over the, the print business and that was it. That's my one thing. I, I did get the, the which is the Ahaba collection, to get to buy one of her pieces. But that was kind of like, it needs to be museums, but I didn't do anything else about that because we were just too busy dealing with the day-to-day uh, business of, of running the, the, the art business as it was. And then when I sold it, it was sort of like, okay, I'm, I'm done with it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but now it's back, you know, and when she passed, she gave, she gave me everything. She said, I, you know, I get my artwork. So she, I'm like, okay, now what do I do with that? <laughs> I want this to be recognized properly.